Hello, hello. Welcome to Will Radio Tuesday, March 5th, 2024. And I just want to talk a little bit about what I've been up to. I haven't made a lot of videos recently, um, but this week I think I'll be able to make more. I hope to be able to make three today. All right, so what have I been up to the last few days? I've been thinking a fair amount about the book I want to write, and I've, you know, well, I'm going to make another video about that, so. Uh, but I've been thinking about that and trying to screw up my courage and think hard about what I really want to create. I'm getting a better and better sense, so. Um, this morning I woke up early and just spent a couple hours thinking about what I want to do. And uh, sort of by the end, I was getting nerd chills, as Artosis would say. Um, I was definitely envisioning the book that I'd want to read. I don't know if anyone else would want to read it. You know, probably, I think that's the sort of book that resonates with people, is the, the book that, if you write a book that you would want to read, it'll resonate at least with some people, and other people will ignore it, or maybe they dislike it. Maybe intensely, it doesn't matter, but um, I've got a pretty good sense of what I want to write. And it's been modifying, like the, the idea has been changing over time, um, partly based on feedback I've been getting, partly just based on my thinking. And actually, I'm going back towards an idea I had in uh, July of last year. I spent a lot of time thinking about what I wanted to write and I think... The thinking I've done recently, combined with the thinking I did last July, um, I realized I think I can combine those. And there was part of the part of the story I was missing last year, uh, but I think I think I know how to combine it now. So anyway, I've been I've been spending a lot of time on that, and actually, that's one reason I haven't made so many videos. Like uh, yesterday, I could have made at least one video, probably a couple. And instead, I wanted to think about the book and some other things, um, which I think is fine. I think uh, I think it's important for me to remember that all of these videos are an experiment and a way to try to get me unstuck and try to get me moving in the right direction. Um, and so it's it's okay to feel a little pressure to make videos um, so that I actually do something. But at the same time, if it gets to the point where I'm stressing out about the videos to the extent I'm, I'm not doing anything, or if I'm excited to work on the book and I feel guilty about thinking about the book or working on the book, then that's not good. So, yeah, yesterday I just spent time thinking about the book and other things. Also been doing a lot of reading, reading sci-fi. I also got, um, actually, let me see this book. Oh yeah, I also got the, the Psychotronic Encyclopedia of Film and the successor book. This is like between the two of them have 12,000 weird movies. Um, you know, in paperback. Uh, started getting, getting back into the weird movies again. That's been fun. I used to really be into that in the 80s. And then I got the third edition of Stephen H. Strogatz's Nonlinear Dynamics and Chaos with Applications to Physics, Biology, Chemistry, and Engineering. It's a pretty expensive book. It's by CRC Press. Fairly long. It's, uh, I don't know. 530 pages or something and some of the math is beyond me although this is a sort of book where you know that this is like the book where I want to learn math um, because I want to understand what's going on better and it's like it's got a bunch of really cool ideas and applications from chaos theory and complexity theory and nonlinear dynamics and simulation and superconducting Josephine 
Josephine, I don't know how to pronounce it, um, junction examples and all sorts of driven oscillators and bifurcation diagrams, just like state space stuff, really, really cool stuff. Um, a lot of it I have some idea that these things exist, but um, anyway, I've, I've been eyeing this book for a while. It's like, yeah, it's expensive, and while I actually read it, but I do, you know, I've been flipping through it a little bit. So anyway, I'm excited about that book. I, it's a sort of book that has lots of possibilities. I like that. I've uh, been watching lots of YouTube as usual. Um, there are a whole bunch of ACM SIGPLAN videos that have gone up recently from Popple and Associated Workshops, and some of those are quite interesting. So there's uh, workshops on, <clears throat> you know, I think CPP is one, Certified Programs and Proofs or something. There was a talk I was watching last night on using you know, LLMs and Monte Carlo tree search and things like that to guide uh, proof search uh, for proof assistance and automated theorem provers. That was cool. Quite like that. I think a lot of those techniques could probably be applied to Mini Canron, um, that kind of thing. <clears throat> I watched uh, several Jonathan Blow interviews and talks. Uh, there was like one two hour interview that I thought was pretty interesting. And then I saw a talk, which I didn't like as much. Um, but uh, in the interview, he had <clears throat> thoughts about learning Scheme at Berkeley from SICP and uh, how he found it, I think, kind of mystifying. And he didn't think Scheme was a good language, first language for learning programming. And uh, he didn't, didn't like the way it was taught. <clears throat> and I, I thought that was, that was interesting because I have taught Scheme to people as their first language. And I heard similar comments from at least some students, and especially students who had programmed before, who already knew how to program <clears throat> and in some language, usually like C or C++ or, some, or Java, some language quite different from Scheme. Um, and so I, I understand, I think, the frustration. Uh, and so I was thinking, okay, you know, it might, might be interesting to you know, like make a video <clears throat> of how I think about that, because I, I think it is a, a, you know, you know, just like an honest, heartfelt, you know, complaint um, or frustration from someone who is interested in computing. It's like, hey, this isn't what I thought I was signing up for. Um, and also, you know, scheme <clears throat> scheme is different things uh, to different people in different situations. So there's a scheme for SICP, which is really it's it's more like a pseudocode notation for exploring computation. <clears throat> SICP is not about learning scheme. In fact, it even says explicitly that you know they don't actually teach scheme. It's just like they introduce scheme as needed as you go, and that was part of the point. And now there's an SICP in JavaScript. So it shows that the language is less important. However, the JavaScript version, I think, obscures a number of the concepts that are, are very clear in Scheme. So, um, But in that case, it's more like a mathematical notation, which is what McCarthy was originally trying to do with Lisp, is my understanding. And, uh, and then there's a scheme, which is a scheme for hacking on language design and implementation. There's like uh, that. And then there's a scheme for uh, experimenting with with computation and uh, things like Mini Canron. And then there's scheme programming in the large. And then there's battery included schemes or things like Racket that started as a batteries included scheme and then diverge. So when people talk about scheme, it's probably really four different things. Um, and I think part of the issue is that if you're reading the little schemer, <clears throat> you know, like I thought I wanted to learn scheme because I, I had looked at SICP and when I first saw the little schemer, I said, Hey, uh, great. I will learn scheme. 
And then I started looking at it. I was like, what in the world is this? And I put it back on the shelf in the bookstore. Um, and, you know, this sort of an unfortunate title because the little schemer is not about scheme. It's about thinking recursively. That's what it's about. And so if you read that book thinking you're going to learn scheme or it's a scheme manual, you're bound to be disappointed because that's not at all what it is. And I think it's the same for SICP. If you if you go into SICP thinking that this is going to teach you how to write applications or, you know, games or <clears throat> whatever, or teach you all the minutia of a programming language, um, you're bound to be disappointed and mystified and, you know, try, very confused probably. Um, and you could, you'll you also probably come away with this idea that Scheme is a toy language, that the ideas are not very powerful. It's just an idea, of, just like a, a little simple language for teaching. Um, and maybe you'll think that what you see in that book is all that functional programming is. <clears throat> um, there's a whole bunch of things that you might come away with the impression. And and then the other thing is the way experienced schemers actually use the language when they are you know, not in teaching mode, but actually in let's get something awesome done mode is so different than, than the way it's taught in a book like The Little Schemer or SICP or How to Design Programs you know, now that's that one's more racket. But when you watch someone who's really an expert schemer using all of their ticks and you know tricks and techniques, um, it's it's a very very different beast. And so, in that sense, I understand. You know, I, I understand. Uh, I think Jonathan Blow's frustration, and I think part of the frustration of teaching scheme as an intro language is that you don't have time and the students don't yet have the concepts to show the really advanced part. And and the really advanced part is is just like a very different beast. It's like, <clears throat> you know, scheme is sort of this trimodal distribution maybe where it's a very good simple notation for describing computation because the syntax is so simple and regular. You don't have to worry about precedence. You don't have to worry about parsing and all that stuff. And you have things like quote and eval very, very nice notation. And you can see people keep reinventing S expressions, right? So, you know, if you look at, I mean, there are a whole bunch of computational systems that I know of that are not really intended to be Lisps, but where S expression syntax is used because it is a very elementary approach to give you like an abstract syntax tree. So, you know, like people keep reinventing or reusing S expressions for a reason. You know, it's a very, very elementary. Um, and so, and you can look at things like XML as sort of S expressions gone bad. And um, anyway, so there's the notation part, and that is quite different from the super hacking part for, um, you know, experimenting with language design and implementation. Uh, where you're pulling out all the stops, and that's quite different from programming in large, you know. So at least those three versions, <clears throat> they're, they're different enough from each other that they really have to be seen as separate things, but they're all in the same syntax. It's a little like in, in with prolog syntax, you can have like data log and answer set programming, and then full prolog, and then various restrictions, and various extensions to prolog, and, and the syntax looks the same, <clears throat> There may be restrictions on the syntax or extensions, but you know it pretty much looks the same. Certainly, if you're a beginner, <clears throat> but the actual the power of the languages are, are vastly different. Schemes a little like that. You know, you can <clears throat> have three totally different things that you call a scheme, um, and because we only show the simple version to students who are first learning the language, they they have this impression that <clears throat> scheme is. Uh, I don't know, the Spartan language that doesn't have much to it. <clears throat> it is, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> mm. 
Um, anyway, when I was when I was thinking about that, <clears throat> I realized I had a lot to say about it, <clears throat> and about scheme in general, and about dynamic types, and that was also one of the things he pointed out is that he spent a lot of time correcting errors that he wouldn't have made in a typed language. Um, and, he, and that was frustrating. Another thing I've heard from multiple people before. So, you know, I, I understand and appreciate that point of view. Um, yeah. So anyway, I, I have thoughts about it because the people I know who teach Scheme or who are really into Scheme, <clears throat> it's not like Scheme was the only language they ever learned. And they're just like, oh, okay, well, that's good enough. It's more like they tried dozens of languages and they ended up at Scheme when they could have picked other languages and they were choosing Scheme to teach or choosing Scheme for research or choosing Scheme for programming at large when that wasn't an obvious choice, you know, so they had to go out of their way to pick the, that language for whatever they were doing. And in general, they did that very thoughtfully. So what is it exactly that these people who are generally very experienced programmers and who know a lot, a lot about lots of languages, not like they don't know about, you know, statically typed languages, or they don't know about imperative programming or object oriented programming or whatever it is. You know, these are people who, who tend to be, sort of far out in the number of languages they've explored, and then for some reason they like Scheme. So why is that? And, you know, so I was thinking, next time someone asks me to give a talk, um, <clears throat> that might be my topic, you know. So anyway, watching various YouTube videos, that was part of it. Watching a lot of videos on writing, George R.R. R. Martin, he's always fun to, to listen to. Uh, watching a lot of StarCraft. ASL, Afrika Star League is on, and uh, <clears throat> Tastosis, uh, Artosis and Tasteless have been commenting on that. And I subscribe to them on Patreon and listen to their secret podcasts and then watch the game. So trying to learn about Brood War, which is uh, like StarCraft 1 expansion pack. That's like the old style. And now there's Brood War Remastered or StarCraft Remastered. Um, so make it update the graphics and some other things. So that's uh, sort of given that that game uh, more life. is very popular in Korea still, even though it's 25 years old, which is really remarkable. It's still played at a very, very high competitive level. Uh, and also I've been watching some StarCraft II GSL. Um, so I haven't been playing any StarCraft. I haven't played StarCraft in a long time. I'm just kind of trying to get myself back into it. StarCraft is something I really love. I'm not that good at it. You know, I'm terrible at Brood War. Uh, StarCraft II, I started getting decent at it. I mean, I'm not like, you know, compared to a pro, I was not decent. Okay. But I started getting to the point where I was getting good enough, fast enough that I thought, okay, hold on. <laughs> you know, do, do I want to learn StarCraft or do I want to learn Japanese or do I want to write a book? Um you know, I was thinking about that because whenever you do one thing, you decide to not do something else. Um, and and when I really get into StarCraft, you know, it's like getting into a book or something. I, I want to think about it and I want to play it. And if I'm not careful, I'll stay up all night playing or something like that. Um, so, you know, could I do something where I played StarCraft 2 or, you know, a few games a week. Um, maybe, maybe I could do that. You know, uh, would that be reasonable? Would I enjoy it? Would I improve? Mm, maybe, or Brood War. Like Brood War is something I would like to to play. And I have played a little bit on ladder and wow, that is a, a tough game. Just moving your units around, trying to move a Dragoon up a, ma uh, up a ramp. It's almost impossible. So, uh, Starcraft one or brood war is like a micro game. It's like very click, click heavy. You know, you have to very precisely click and pretty quickly. Starcraft two is more of a macro game <clears throat> where a lot of the mechanics are taken care of by the computer in a, a more convenient way. 
so they have different feels that way. Um, I'm not very good with the micro stuff, so so Brood War feels like especially hard, but I still like it. So anyway, I'm not sure what I'll do with that. I was playing some StarCraft II, and I was getting better. Um, and also part of it is, you know, with StarCraft, was it, uh, with StarCraft Remastered, the Brood War version, and StarCraft II, uh, those are online only. So you have to connect to the Blizzard servers. Blizzard could turn those off at some point. Um you know, now Brood War has been around 25 years, but you know, Blizzard's had problems and now they're bought by Microsoft, I guess, but I, there were some issues with that deal. So who knows? Uh, but there's a long history of companies turning off their servers and then the game just doesn't work. Um, now the, the original Brood War, that's still playable via LAN and servers like that. But when, um, StarCraft Remastered came out, the main Korean server shut down. That's my understanding. The Fish server shut down. Um, yeah, so I don't know, but I guess that's one of the things I think about, like chess or Go. You know, I can just play that game. I don't... I'm not... Uh, I'm not worried if Microsoft's going to turn off my access to playing chess, you know. Um, so that's one reason... I'd be interested in Brood War is that, well, there's still the old version of Brood War. That'll be around forever. Um, StarCraft II, that's not true. You have to have, the servers have to be up and running. And, you know, if I'm still around playing video games, you know, 25 years from now, um, you know, will StarCraft II even be playable? I don't know. Uh, but Brood War will be. <laughs> Brood War is forever. So anyway, that's one of the reasons I'd like to get in Brood War. Also, it just I think it's a cool game. It really was the game that created modern esports um, more than any other game. Oh, anyway, that's been fun to watch. Uh, Japanese. I'm trying to get back into Japanese. I did go to a in person Japanese English meetup uh, a couple weekends ago. That was fun. And so it's like, okay, well, how do I get back into Japanese? How do I level up again? Um, so I was watching some anime and trying to get into some shows, and I don't know, it just wasn't that interesting. And one of the things that I've been told multiple times is if you're going to watch anime or a Japanese movie or something, you know, do it without the English subtitles. Like, just don't watch with English subtitles. Um so I said, okay, what, what's a ridiculous thing I can watch? Because I like doing ridiculous things. So like in many ways, doing a ridiculous thing is easier than doing a non-ridiculous thing. So a ridiculous thing is, all right, well, there's this anime called One Piece, which has been, I think, 1999 is when it started. And it's still being made. And it's based on this manga series that's been going on forever. And there are over a thousand episodes, so a one kilo episode, more than a thousand twenty four episodes. Um, and people love this anime. I watched half of the first episode a long time ago, and I never got into it. A long time ago, being years ago, but not. I just wasn't excited by it. But there is this rule for anime is that you're supposed to watch the first three episodes at least. And I hadn't watched the first three. I didn't even watch the first one. And so I said, okay, let, let me just watch the first episode without subtitles. And uh, and without subtitles made it really interesting because I, I had no idea what's going on. Uh, so I just had to pay attention much more closely. And, and I also had to pay attention. I, well, I ended up paying attention a lot more to the animation, animation and the facial expressions, so I, I appreciated it differently, and I would pick up little snippets here and there that I could understand. Um, and so I said, okay, I think I can hack this. I will watch all episodes of of One Piece, which is, I don't know, I think last time I checked, they were up to like 1,040 or something, a lot, and they're still making them. So <clears throat> I'll watch all of One Piece, um, without English subtitles. So I watched, I think the first 
four episodes or something. I mean, my sense is that this is going to take probably a few hundred episodes for me to even like get into it. I don't know. Uh, Gintama, which is another long running anime. Um, you know, I think that took something like, I had to watch like the first 13 episodes or something before it seemed to start settling down a little bit. Um, you know, the first few episodes of Gintama seem to have nothing to do with the rest of it. It's more like its own little arc to just get you um, involved in the story. Anyway, um, so that's what I'm going to do. And then I was talking to a friend about this, and my friend was suggesting, it's like, oh, well, you're watching it with subtitles, right? And I said, well, unfortunately on Crunchyroll, there are no Japanese subtitles. I was like, oh, wow, that's too bad. And so I'm going to go ahead and get Netflix because Netflix has one piece. And Netflix is famous for Japanese learners because it has Japanese subtitles for Japanese shows. So I will watch one piece on Netflix. I've never had Netflix before. Um, my parents have had Netflix, and I, I just wasn't that impressed with their selection. But they are supposed to be really good for Japanese media and especially for Japanese learners because of the Japanese subtitles and also I hope that that will help me with my kanji which I've studied some with the Heisig book but I don't know the readings for most of the kanji even the ones I've learned and I kind of fell off of that so I think uh, I think if I'm reading the kanji while I'm hearing it that will go go a long way and maybe I'll start picking up on my kanji again. So that's one of the big challenges of learning Japanese as an English speaker is I don't know the the kanji or the, the Chinese characters. So, you know, I, do I focus on the uh, spoken language so I could communicate with people in Japan, for example? Or do I uh, focus on the reading you know, because I, I have plenty of friends who can speak Japanese conversationally and they live in Japan, but they can't read a newspaper or whatever or can't read a book. Um, that's I, I love books so much and reading and all that that it's hard for me to, you know, that I wouldn't want to do that. Um, but at the same time, and, and being able to read definitely helps learning vocabulary and things like that. But at the same time, you know, it's kind of frustrating because it takes a long time. There's, you know, about 2,200 uh, of these characters you have to learn to get up to high school level, um, the end of high school. And, you know, it's it's, it's considerable effort required. Uh, so I've put in some of that effort, but I was getting frustrated partly just because, uh, you know, I was trying to speak to people and I... I I was learning how to write things, but I didn't know how to pronounce what I was writing. I didn't know the vocabulary and I, you know, the, the spoken part wasn't doing well. So at the in-person Japanese English meetup, one person I talked to said, well, you, you don't really need to learn the kanji, you know, just focus on the, the spoken part and, you know, read manga with furigana or something with a, which are like the little kana characters written on top of the kanji, and you know you'll get a you'll get up to speed over time. And another person I talked to, who used to live in Japan and and speaks Japanese at a high level, as far as I can tell, um, certainly much higher than I am, uh, had a different opinion, saying actually you know the Heisig stuff is good and learning those kanji are good and. As you learn those kanji, you will you will find it much easier to approach, um, you know, written things and to read captions and so forth. So, I think I think that second perspective is probably the one I'll take. So, if I can read, uh, if I can see these Japanese subtitles while I'm watching the show, I think that will motivate me to go back to Heisig or some some other approach and uh, connect that with sentences and vocabulary and pronunciation and all that. So, you know, that's, you know, um, I guess part of it is, you know, I think the main thing is just keep working on it, keep making progress. It's just, you know, Japanese isn't a language I'm going to learn in a month. You know, it's just, it's going to take years. So just 
keep working at it. Uh, work, some exciting things going on with work. Uh, I probably can't talk about those right now, but there, there's some neat things there. So I was excited about that yesterday. Uh, got some good news with things we're doing with uh, precision medicine. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I, I haven't talked a lot about work on these videos, but obviously that takes a lot of my time and attention. Um, thinking about videos. Okay, so I've largely taken a break recently from making a lot of videos. So it's given me time to think about what I wanted to do. Um, so I do have some ideas and... Yeah, so my my thinking about the videos and what I want to do, I'm still developing that, but yeah, I've got I've got some ideas that I think I'll be ready to share in a little bit. Um, and then, you know, speaking of videos, one reason, as I've mentioned, that I don't always make videos, even if I have time during the day, is you know, just because I have free time during the day. You know, especially if it's early in the morning or late at night, doesn't mean that I can make a video just because, you know, it's easy to interrupt people. Uh, because when I'm talking, I often don't pay attention to the volume of my voice. Um, and, yeah, it can be very loud. So <clears throat> I, I spent a fair amount of time researching ways to record audio to not disturb people. Um, and I found these devices for practicing karaoke singing or to practice singing, um, different techniques people use. I found microphones for doing audio dictation for stenographers. <clears throat> or there's, there's like this mask that covers your face that's supposed to muffle your sound. And then there's some uh, <clears throat> crowdfunded based devices and things like that that are supposed to serve similar purposes so that you can have a private conversation at a coffee shop or on an airplane or something, theoretically. Um, there's even a U.S. Marine Corps surplus type device that you can talk into uh, so the enemy can't hear you or something like that. And there are these like throat mics for SWAT teams. I mean, there are all sorts of of things people have come up with. There are also these booths, you know, so they're like these portable sound booths that you can, like a recording booth. Um, the big ones you actually construct in a room and, and it's supposed to be uh, keep out outside noise, but, you know, you're supposed to be able to sing loudly or yell or whatever, and it's not supposed to... Uh, leak out too much and you can soundproof rooms. I've looked at different ways to do that. Uh, there's also these kind of portable recording booths. There's one that's on a pole and it's basically like this big box you stick your head through and it rests on your shoulders. Um, and apparently that's very effective. I mean, the one of them costs like $2,000. Uh, it's very effective in reducing the noise, but Apparently it has this like kind of booming sound. Uh, the steno mask, um, the the audio quality is not good. The throat mic audio quality is horrible. You know, so anyway, I've spent a sort of ridiculous amount of time looking into every single option that I can think of, and uh, you know, I think the best. The best option is I can make videos when uh, I can make videos. I, that none of those seem, even if I was willing to spend the money, none of those seem like practical. So, for example, say I spent two thousand dollars and got that portable thing on a pole. Well, I probably could make a video, um, but there are audio issues, and you can't fit a laptop into that thing. You know, you can fit like a little iPad to read lyrics if you're singing. It's really for singing. So a lot of these things are for singing and you can't fit a laptop or a keyboard. So it's just not, doesn't seem very pragmatic. There are probably the closest thing I saw that was kind of interesting was there's these kind of desk sound booths. Um, you can put it on a desk and it has like acoustic tiles on the inside 
and there's kind of this little flap that you you know, like goes over your head or something um and you know you can have a laptop in there so that that's spacious enough that that would fit and you know i think it would reduce the sound some um but not enough to to make sense i don't think and it would be pretty uncomfortable setup i think so anyway the, the, those were interesting ideas. I took it very seriously. I said, okay, what's the weirdest things I can do? The, the weirdest looking ones are, you know, these things that you strap onto your face, like a feed bag for a horse. Um, there's some pretty funny pictures online of people with that and VR goggles. Um, it's like, well, okay, well, that's the sort of look that <laughs> so hilariously ridiculous looking that I could get into. But... Uh, that one hadn't been released yet, I don't think. And also, it just it seems like a lot of these things just don't work well. Either the sound quality is bad or they don't, you know, it's like sort of they muffle your voice so people can't hear what you're saying, but it's not like it's really silent. Um, the ones that are mostly silent uh, seem to, to really affect the audio quality. So, yeah. Anyway, I, I have looked into that to make videos more often i mean i could make silent videos like mic mic free videos um <clears throat> but right now i don't think i will i think i'll take this challenge in the spirit of if i have an opportunity where i can make three videos in a day great um and if i don't well that's great i can think about my book and these other things that that i'm interested in um so anyway that's what I've been up to. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.